Hey, thank you. Thank you for hanging around for my talk, uh, and thanks to the organisers for inviting me. I feel like I need a broom now so I can sweep Kubernetes around the world. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Mandy Waite. I'm a developer advocate for Google Cloud Platform. You can contact me there. Uh, and every slide has got my Twitter handle, so if you have any questions about this talk or Kubernetes in general, please feel free to tweet me. And so, yeah, this talk is about Kubernetes, and Kubernetes uh, is really fundamentally changing the way we think and talk about computing. Uh, we haven't really kind of finished the vocabulary yet, but we're getting there. So I'm going to talk about that. And really, this all started with uh, operating systems, uh, sorry, m m machines, and then idealized hardware uh, in terms of the hypervisor that we stuck on top of the hardware. Uh, and that allowed us to run virtual machines on top of it. And then with the uh, Linux C groups, Linux namespaces, and the advent of containers, uh, we then had uh, an abstraction that moved up one layer. Uh, now we had an idealized operating system instead of an idealized piece of hardware. And on top of that, we could schedule containers. We could run containers, uh, application-level uh, containers that carried their dependencies and their environment around with them. And that made them extremely portable and also extremely schedulable, which is interesting. And we probably already worked this out. Containers are awesome, and you probably want to use lots and lots of them. And then, of course, you're going to get yourself into a problem. You're running lots of these containers, and how are you going to run them? How are you going to manage them? And we introduce a new concept now, the container cluster. And clusters are always an aggregation of uh, machines, either bare metal machines or virtual machines. And in the case of a container cluster, that would be with additional plumbing that can be used to run containers. Then on top of that, we put a container cluster manager. And this is a dynamic system that manages groups of containers and also the connectivity between those groups of containers. And then we get to Kubernetes itself with this interesting logo. And Kubernetes is a canonical uh, container cluster manager. It's not a reference implementation. This is open source, but it's product ready. You can use it today. And interestingly enough, Kubernetes doesn't actually schedule containers. It doesn't run containers. It runs things called pods. And pods are effectively modeling an application-specific logical host that will host containers. It's an interesting concept. And containers in a pod, uh, they talk to each other via local host, like they would do if they were on the same machine. And they share the same uh, network IP, port, and IPC namespaces. And also, pods have IP addresses that are routable, no NAT involved. This means that pods can talk to each other, uh, regardless of which node they're running on. So we have many uh, nodes within our cluster. The pods can talk to each other directly. And also, Kubernetes provides a de declarative language for scheduling pods. And that looks something like this. We can specify a uh, number of replicas, number of instances of this pod that we want. We can also specify the name, uh, the container image we want to use. We can also specify, interestingly, uh, resource limits in terms of CPU and memory. And then we can specify things like configuration information, like port numbers, and also volume mounts. We can mount volumes that can be accessed by the containers within the pod. And then scheduling itself, this is the one I always struggle with, scheduling, we're repurposing that term. Uh, this is very, very similar to the Linux scheduler, the unit scheduler. And basically, uh, the idea is uh, it's a method by which something you want to run can be assigned to resources on which can run it. And in order to better understand scheduling, we need to kind of understand the structure of what a node looks like within our cluster. And the node looks something like this. We have the big blue box, the light blue box. We have some uh, containerized plumbing. Uh, these are the dark blue boxes. And then nodes themselves have resources in terms of CPU and in terms of memory. They can also mount disks, external disks, network attached disks. And they can also have labels. So pods within our cluster can be a little bit snowflakey. They can have uh, maybe an SSD disk or a GPU. And we can identify them specifically by a label. And what needs to happen then is we need our scheduler, the thing that will actually schedule our pods that contains our containers, on a particular node. And in order to do that, the scheduler has to ask some questions. It has to ask questions like, what resources in terms of CPU and memory does it need? Uh, what disks does it need? Does it need a specific disk? If we're running MySQL, we need maybe a specific disk. Uh, what node does it want to run on? It may be very snowflakey and say, I want to run on this specific node by name. Uh, or it can call out nodes via their labels. And again, if it needs SSD, it can say, disk equals SSD is the label I need. And the scheduler can therefore identify potential nodes on which can, uh, this pod can run. 
Once we've identified potential nodes that we can run, we need to rank them in some way. And we have different ranking algorithms uh, available today. There's ultimately going to be other ranking algorithms, but these are the ones we have currently. And the first one is to prefer a node that will have the most resources once the pod is deployed, the most free resources left once the pod is deployed. We can prefer nodes with a specific label. So it goes back to, does this pod require SSD? So we can prefer, prefer nodes, that way, nodes, nodes that way. We can also try to minimize the number of pods, a number of pods from a specific service running on the same node for higher redundancy. And also, we can try to manage CPU and memory balance. So we can try to make sure that once the pod is deployed, the memory and the CPU are balanced, meaning ultimately we can more effectively utilize our resources. And we're going to dive into that point now a little bit more. But first, the thing we need to think about is, do machines have shapes? Machines have shapes. Yes, they do. Also, interestingly enough, workloads have shapes too. And so this is an example of, oh, I'm going ahead one. <laughs> uh, effectively, within our cluster, the node, the actual machine, becomes a resource boundary. Uh, we have a certain amount of CPU and a certain amount of memory available to us for running a specific pod. Ultimately, when we get to vertical scaling, that will go away. We'll be able to scale uh, these uh, nodes dynamically. But today, they act as a resource boundary. And so we see situations like this. We have uh, particular machine shapes, and we also have much more arbitrary workload shapes. And what we can do, my Tetris doesn't work, so this is kind of Tetris-y, but it doesn't quite work very well with the uh, animations here. But we have a couple of machines here. We have one with eight gigabytes of RAM, one with one core, another one with eight gigabytes of RAM and two cores. And we can take our job and we can deploy it to it. And this pod requires uh, one core and two gigs of RAM, and once we've deployed that, we've effectively used all of our CPU. Uh, and we actually have 5.5 gigabytes of RAM that's now inaccessible to us. This is something that's called resource stranding. Uh, so no, no longer that 5.5 gigabytes of RAM can be used by us. If we deployed that same workload to a machine with two cores, however, we would see this situation, whereby we have 5.5 gigabytes of RAM available and also one CPU core available. That means we can run another pod, and this pod much bigger, five gigabytes of RAM, one core. And now we have effectively utilized all of our memory and utilized all of our CPU. Uh, this is efficient bin packing. And this is our game of Tetris. We're playing with computing. So ultimately, this is just a brief introduction to what Kubernetes does and how it's changing the way we think and talk about computing. Uh, this is going to develop over time. Uh, for now, we're left with the new language of computing, uh, things like hypervisors and containers, container clusters, Kubernetes, pods, resource scheduling, all of that kind of thing. And ultimately, Kubernetes is very, very accessible. Uh, it is open source. Uh, it's been open source since June 2014. It's now at version 1.0. Uh, we have in Google a hosted version called Google Container Engine. Uh, this basically makes it very, very simple to spin up a cluster. And um, we manage the whole cluster for you. And this was made generally available in August 2015. Uh, there are various platform as a service offerings uh, from Red Hat, uh, Red Hat OpenShift, uh, and others, and also other distros as well. And currently, Kubernetes is driving towards a 1.1 release, and then ultimately a 1.2 release, probably sometimes in January. And finally, just to wrap up, Kubernetes is open source, which is why we're here, right? Uh, and we want your help. So if you're interested in Kubernetes, if you're interested in looking at this stuff, please check out the documentation at kubernetes.io. And also go to the GitHub repository. Most stuff happens on GitHub uh, with Kubernetes. You can go to Google Cloud Platform slash Kubernetes or just slash Kubernetes slash Kubernetes. And also you can find us on IRC, freenode.net, hash Google containers, or you can tweet us at Kubernetes.io. And that's me. Thank you very much for listening. I appreciate it. Thank you.